have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter number 30. And while you're turning, there are a couple of things we want to mention, some prayer requests that we would like for you to remember. Um, there was an email that went out this week uh, in regards to Doris Minor. Doris has congestive heart failure, and she had been in the hospital there in St. Louis for a few days. Um, they were able to remove uh, quite a bit of fluid from her lungs, um, but they've sent her home with hospice. So if you would keep Doris in your prayers and her family uh, in your prayers and just pray the Lord would bless accordingly. Continue to keep Jim Pennington in your prayers and lift him up if you would and just pray that God would be ever near and dear to him at this time. We have a couple of unspoken requests that have been mentioned that they prefer to keep uh, unspoken, but if you would remember those in prayer, we would greatly appreciate that as well. And then also I had a little birdie tell me that this last week that Bruce Miles celebrated his 85th birthday. Is that correct? Bruce, is that right? <laughs> He's not sure how to respond to this, but... Uh, the guys wanted me to give you a hard time that we're on the trip with you, so I had, I had to do that. So. And so our men that had gone down to uh, Florida to help with the uh, disaster relief that had made it back in early this morning, uh, and Gary was sharing a little bit in the Sunday school class about how God blessed and what God had done. And so for all of those that went on that trip, thank you for going. We're glad you're back safe and sound, and thank you for your willingness uh, to help and to serve others. Um, also, this being Thanksgiving, anybody got a Thanksgiving you'd like to share real quickly? Give you an opportunity to be a part of the service if you would like to. How many of you are thankful? But how many of you are shy? <laughs> uh, we're, we, we appreciate you being here this morning. In the book of Psalms, uh, chapter number 30, we're going to be looking at a psalm of praise and you know we really do have a lot to be thankful for uh, not only are we thankful for our salvation but we are thankful for a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and a God that watches over and cares for us but in this psalm today we're going to look at a God who is forgiving and a God who is merciful and I don't know about you I'm, I'll just preach to myself this morning if it's all right there are times when the decisions that I make may not be exactly what I should do. Can anybody relate to that with me? There are times that I, I, I find myself experiencing the discipline of God because of choices that I've made. But one of the things I'm grateful for is we serve a merciful, loving God. And I would tell you that not only can we do things that are wrong, but we can fail to do things that are right. And that's, that, that's a failure as well. And when I look at this passage of Scripture, and it deals with a gentleman by the name of David, and I know in the past we spent a number of, of messages talking about David, but David is the guy, if you'll remember correctly, who was considered to be a man after God's own heart. And yet when you look at the life of David, it's very evident that David fell and stumbled and sinned on different occasions. This particular passage is entitled in my, in my Bible, A Psalm and a Song of the Ded Dedication of the House of David. Now no, most people want to say that this has application to the dedication of the temple, but let me remind you, David was already dead and in the grave when Solomon built that temple. It is a possibility that this was written in a prophetic tone to be used at that particular time because we know that David took, went to great lengths to gather the material that Solomon and the builders would use to build the temple, and that's a possibility. But I really believe that what this psalm is about is when David's kingdom was established. And God solidified him on the throne of Israel there and used him to bless the nation. We remember the story of David, how that as a young boy he went out and he slew the giant Goliath. 
He was anointed to be king of Israel there, and for the next few years, Saul continued to reign. David found himself faithfully serving Saul and faithfully serving his nation, but because of jealousy, Saul began to pursue his life, and he, began to, he had to flee and hide for years to come. Ultimately, Saul passed away, and David was anointed king of Israel. As David was placed upon that throne and as he began to trust his God and as he began to, to, to do the things that God had called him to do, God blessed him in a great and mighty way. But there came a time in David's life when David became a little self-sufficient. Now, what I mean by that, he got comfortable with who he was and the authority and the power that he had. When he was sitting on that throne and all the enemies had been defeated and he was sitting on that throne, he began to think a little bit more of himself and who he was and what he had done. Rather than give the glory to God and the praise to God, he took that glory for himself and God brought judgment on him as a result of that. If you go back to 1 Chronicles chapter number 29, we have the account of how David, in, in a position of security and power and position, he decided he was going to number the children of Israel. He wanted to see just how great and how vast his army was. And you know the story that when he numbered those and he sent Joab out to number those people, God brought a plague upon the nation of Israel and multitudes died and David found himself coming to a place where he realized it wasn't who he was, it wasn't what he could do, it was God behind him that had lifted him up, and it was God that was going to sustain him, and he found himself bowing before God, confessing his sin, and asking God to forgive him and cleanse him. Now, I don't know in your life your circumstances and where you've come from. But I would be willing to say that most every one of us have found ourselves in a similar position. Maybe we're not sitting on the throne, but we are in a position of affluence and God has blessed us and we begin to think a little bit more importantly of ourselves than we do realize that God is the one that has blessed us and given us what we have. There comes time in my life that I've had to bow before him and, and confess my sins and say, Father, I'm sorry, forgive me, and let, help me to rest upon you and trust you for the things that you're going to do in my life. David finds himself, and if you'll just look at verse number 6 with me, he said, in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. David was, was, was so secure in his position in his army, in his ability, in all the things that he had accomplished in his life, that he, took that, that he took that honor to himself and began to think that he was the one in control of the events of his life. And God reveals to him, it's not you, David. It's me. I'm the one that's blessed you. I'm the one that has lifted you out of the sheep coats and put you on the throne. I'm the one that has enabled you to go out and fight against your enemies and have given you victory. I'm the one that has you where you are, and if I put you there, I can take you out just as simply. And when David came to the conclusion and he came to the understanding that because of his feeling of self-sufficiency, because he thought it, it was all about him and not about God, God opened his eyes to see that God was still on the throne and David was in his hands. And what I'm trying to tell you in this particular psalm, David has come to the realization, yeah, I've accomplished a lot, but it's not me. It's what God's done through me. He makes the statement in verse number 1. He said, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and has not made my foes to rejoice over me. And when you think about the word extol there, it means to exalt or lift up. What he is saying here, because of God's mercy, forgiveness, and grace, the joy of David's soul had been returned to him again, and now he was able to praise his God because of a right understanding of who God was, what God had done, and he was going to praise God for all the good things that had happened in David's life. When he makes the statement there and said, Oh, Lord, thou hast lifted me up, the picture is there is a bucket in a well, if you would. Now, they let down the bucket to, to, to fill it with water, and then they raise it back up. When David came to the realization that God's different,
discipline was resting upon him. He broke his spirit, and he was as low as could be. And isn't that the way conviction is? When God brings conviction into our life, it helps us to see ourselves as we really are and who we are in front of a holy God. And David realized the sin that he had committed after all that God had blessed him with. But there's something about the mercy and forgiveness of God. When we're willing to get on our knees and when we're willing to get things right with God, when we're willing to ask forgiveness of our sin, and when we are willing to once again praise His name and honor Him for who He is, just like a bucket of water, He'll lift us up. And He'll bring us to the place where we can once again rejoice and praise God for His goodness and His mercy and His grace. If there's one thing that we ought to be thankful for outside of salvation, it is the forgiving grace of Almighty God as He works in our lives. When David goes on and he he speaks in this psalm. Verse number 2, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. Think about this. When David realized that he had brought this calamity upon himself, there was only one place he could go. Joab couldn't fix it. The army of Israel couldn't fix it. The prophets of God couldn't fix it. The only one that could fix this and make it right was the God that he had committed himself to early in his life. And he came to God and he cried out in verse number 2. And it says that the Lord healed me. Folks, let me tell you something. I am so grateful for 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David came to the Lord and cried out, and he says there in verse number 2, Thou hast healed me. You've put the past behind, and you've lifted me up, and you've made me whole again. Verse 3 goes on and says, O Lord, Thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. What David is saying, he come to the realization, without God and without the Lord leading him, his life was virtually over. He needed God to restore him to a place of position, a place of power, and a place of service. And so he praises the Lord for doing that. Verse number 4, he encourages others to join in the praise. And he says here in verse number 4, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks to the remembrance of His holiness. Listen, that's something we all can do. Every last one of us here this morning have been touched by God in some way, and we have something to rejoice in and praise God for. And I'm telling you, I understand and I I believe that life can be tough. And I believe circumstances can, can, you know, affect us in a negative way. We can almost become overwhelmed. But when we start looking at all that God has done for us, there's things that we can rejoice in and praise God for. Notice verse number 5, and you might underline this verse. His anger endureth but for a moment. Now what he's talking about there, discipline is not fun. Let me just ask this question, and I'm just going to see how many honest people we have here today. That'd be all right? How many of you, when you were young, were disciplined by your parents? Okay. All right. Almost all over the place. How many of you asked for it? Bobby asked for it. Let's pray for him, all right? Did you enjoy the discipline? That's not the purpose of discipline for us to enjoy it. The purpose of discipline is for correction in the life of the individual. I didn't enjoy it. And by the way, I lived in the days when spanking was still okay. That was before the 800 number, all right? So that tells you, that tells you how old I am. And by the way, just for the record, yes, I still believe discipline is a good thing. Okay, now that's a personal opinion, and you can work it out on your own, but I still think it's a good thing. But what I know is, is that when discipline came, in most occasions, now there were a time or two that I got it that it wasn't my fault, but most of you know how honry I am, and most of it was justified, and when I got it, it was, right, it was the right thing to do because I had done something. I'm trying to be careful and not give too much away here. I, I, I could be honry when I wanted to, and you can say amen if you want. Anyway... Jim, I got you now. Discipline is not, is not administered for fun. It's for correction. 
And most of us here know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about God's discipline on our lives when we get outside of His will for our life, when we make bad decisions and choices. But God's discipline is not given to us or He doesn't administer it to us to break us or to hurt us. He does it to correct us and bring us back to a proper mindset where we can understand who He is, what He's doing, and give Him the honor and praise. That's what David's talking about here. When he makes the statement there in verse number 5, his anger endureth for a moment, in his favor is life. Here's the thing. I can tell you honestly, and you can probably relate to this with your parents, there were times my dad and my mom have always been my, my dad and mom from the time that I was born. But there were times I'm not sure they wanted to claim me. And to be perfectly honest, there were times I'm not sure I wanted to claim them. It's amazing how those teenage years work. But what I'm saying is that discipline that they would give me might have lasted for a short period of time. But the one thing I always knew was that my mom and dad loved me. And no matter what I did, no matter what stupid choices I made, No matter what I might have said, they loved me. Child of God, we need to remember that. When God brings discipline into our life, He's doing it to correct us. He's doing it to bring us back to a proper mindset so that we can see things as He wants us to see it. He's not doing it to hurt us. He's doing it to help us. And one thing we can always remember, even in the midst of discipline, God loves us. And we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that. We've already read verse number 6 when it talks about his prosperity and how he would never be moved, that self-reliance. Verse 7 goes on and says, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand. And what David is saying is, now that I can see things correctly, now that I've confessed my self-sufficiency, now that I realize who you are, I understand I am on the throne now. Israel is strong and thriving, not because of me, God, but because of you. You're the one that's brought me here. You're the one that's allowed me to sit on this throne. You're the one that has allowed me to lead this nation. And God, I understand that. He goes on and he says, Not only is mountain stand, thou did hide thy face when I was troubled. When he sinned against God with that self-sufficiency, the God that had provided for him and cared for him allowed him to go through difficulties and hardships, again, not for him to be defeated and destroyed, but to bring him to an understanding that it wasn't David, it was God. And sometimes when when we make bad choices, God may hide his face from us for a period of time, but remember, He's still on the throne, and he still loves us. David said, I cried unto thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, Lord. Be thou my helper. And that's where we need to go. If there's something in our life that is impacted and is keeping us from having the fellowship with God like he wants us to have, The place to go is to the presence of God, to bow before Him and to acknowledge our sins and to ask Him for His help. Now listen in verse number 11 and 12, if you would. Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing. Have you ever been there? You ever experienced that? And I, you know, what, what he's trying to say here is you've taken me from the depths of despair and you put me back on the mountaintop emotionally. When he said, you turn my mourning to dancing, what David is saying is, God, I do not deserve it, but in your mercy and your grace and your faithfulness, you've turned those circumstances around. That which had me down and discouraged and frustrated, you've forgiven me for it, you've taken away, and now I have the privilege once again to praise your name and thank you for who you are. Turn mourning to dancing. And then he goes on and says, not only mourning to dancing, but thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. I am glad that we serve a God that when we, when we, we confess our sins and get right with him, I'm glad we serve a God that will once again allow us to be involved in the service of Almighty God. 
I'm, when he talks about that sackcloth, that was, the, that was the clothing that was worn during mourning. His mourning is done. That part of his life is over. He is now looking at things with a proper perspective, and he is, in re, he is rejoicing in all the goodness and greatness that God is allowed to be a part of his life. He goes on in that, in that next verse and says, To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Let me just close with this thought. We can rejoice because if we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we can rejoice because there's a day coming when this flesh, this corruptible is going to be made incorruptible. We can rejoice in the fact and look forward to the fact that this mortal is going to put on immortality. We have the promises, children of God, in being bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that there is a day coming when we are going to be able to, to dwell in His presence forevermore and we are going to sing praises to the one that gave Himself for us so that our lives could be transformed and changed. Folks, we've got a lot to be thankful for. God has been much better and much better he has blessed me much more than I deserve. You know that and I know that. We have a lot to be thankful for, the way that God has impacted our lives and worked in our lives and moved in our lives. Why he would want to save me, I don't understand, but man, am I glad he did. Why he would allow me the opportunity to stand in front of a group of people and proclaim his word, I really don't understand it, but man, am I glad he did. I am grateful for the way that God has impacted my life. And I am grateful for a God who is willing to forgive and is willing to cleanse and willing to restore to a right relationship. We have and we serve a great God. God help us to remember it's not who we are. It's not what we do. It's not what we've accomplished. It's what he's done through us that really makes the difference. We have so much to be thankful for. We serve an awesome God. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would please. With heads bowed and with eyes closed.